This is Command Post, a series of discussions about military matters from Time and the Center for a New American Security. People talk about, you know, redundancies in the, in the military. You know, they say, well, gee whiz, the, uh, the world's second largest air force is flown by the U.S. Navy. The world's largest air force is flown by the U.S. Air Force. Um, people say, do we need two land armies, an army and a Marine Corps? I mean, these obvious, if you're a member of those tribes, I guess you feel pretty strongly why yours is unique and, and can't be shared. But as we move into the 21st century, is there some consolidation that can be done and some savings that can be had? There's no doubt that there are savings that can be made. And I, I'm, uh, one of my mentors is uh, Gordon England, uh, uh, former Deputy Secretary of Defense, who said he understood why we needed an army and a navy. Uh, understood why we need an Air Force, understood why the Navy needed its own Army, but he said he had a hard time understanding why the Navy's Army needed its own Air Force. And, and uh, questions like that, I think, are going to be looked at really, really hard. But I'm, I'm reminded of, of my friend uh, Paul Van Riper, a retired Lieutenant General of the Marines, who, when he was running the Marine Corps Combat Development Command at Quantico, would give this speech to every class of Marines who came through, and I will repeat it in its entirety. General Van Riper would go out on stage, and, and tell the assembled Marines, America needs an Army. America needs a Navy. America needs an Air Force. America does not need a Marine Corps. But America wants a Marine Corps, and it's each and every one of your jobs each and every day to make sure that America continues to want a Marine Corps for the next 200 years. And, and, and what are your questions? And, and, and so the, the Marines, I, I, I think, like all of the services, are going to be thinking hard about what their roles and missions are going to be in this new world. Uh, I think we're going to, to look hard to identify redundancies, but I, I do think that uh, the American people are enormously proud of love, I would go so far as to say, their armed forces, and I think they are right to do so. Uh, I think we're going to have to make hard decisions as a nation uh, about whether we can continue to afford the services that have done so much for them, in particular, during this last decade of war. Yeah, I think without question we're going to see some degree of consolidation and some hard decisions that are going to have to be made. There's no, no question we're going to continue to have an Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marines. What their roles and their functions are may change a bit. And, and I think in the case of the Marine Corps, I, I uh, was at the Naval War College a few weeks ago, and I did a side-by-side -side comparison of the U.S. Marine Corps to the British military. And in almost every category, the U.S. Marine Corps won. They had uh, about 45,000 more people in uniform than the whole British military. They had more strike aircraft than the Royal Air Force. They had more tanks and artillery than the British Army. And they're our smallest service. So this, this whole economies of scale and the issue of how big our forces are and what their requirements are, what their missions are, is going to have to be looked at because we do dwarf even many of our strongest allies around the world. That's not to say we're going to see any of these forces disappear from, uh, from our pantheon, but I think we're going to have to look very carefully at what they do that's unique and make sure we protect that first and foremost. There's a really important lesson, though, from the British experience, and that's the fact that because they're small, they've had to really use their defense dollars efficiently for a much longer period than the United States has. They're under their own financial pressure, which will you know, really make that problem even worse for them. But what they've been forced to do, at least until this point, is to have more jointness, more cooperation among the services, more headquarters that are involved uh, overseeing members of different services rather than just within uh, any one particular service. And that's the direction that the U.S. military needs to go in uh, in order to have some of the kinds of efficiencies that we're, that we're talking about. Um, reducing the number of headquarters, reducing the number of overall generals and all of the associated staffs that they have. Um, and even in some cases when it comes to procurement and capabilities, it doesn't make sense necessarily to replicate and have an Air Force in the Marines and in the Air Force, and if you count the Army's helicopter, helicopters in the Army as well. Um, pressure to bring aviation together or at least to have the different pieces uh, operate with much more synergy than they have been um, is a potential benefit from this necessarily constrained resource environment. But of course that depends on the specific choices that are made, whether it'll be done in that kind of rationalized way that c continues to provide significant combat power or whether it's done in a disaggregated way that really leaves each of the pieces uh, not able to come together and be more than the sum of their parts.